Welcome back to this week's episode of the Goonery. Myself and Brandon here, admirably, I might say, battling through COVID. And I don't know what's worse, either that or the White Sox hat he's wearing, because it's a horrible time to be a fan of that sad excuse for a franchise. But we're here. Uh, we're here to discuss. We're going to have some Kevin Durant talk, Chicago Bears uh, preseason impressions, some wrestling per usual, and then some wild a wild take from Stephen A. Smith to kind of wrap up the show here. But, Brandon, I just want to get – you're uh, like, what's the pulse on the East Coast right now with Kevin Durant saying that, and that's coming out saying that he's going to be back and he's going to play there for the rest of his four years he has left on his contract? Yeah, so I would say, like a lot of people think like me at 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 one point, maybe like a couple of weeks ago, even when uh, KD said he still wants to be out of Brooklyn, I think. It was I, – I didn't think his uh, request was not genuine, but I think the market for him is what really made it a little less likely he was actually going to be moved. And the whole thing with him saying he was the state of four years, I mean, you better. I mean, not for nothing. Let's look at it. The KD came – he, had, he was given everything he wanted. He was given Kyrie Irving. He was given James Harden until James Harden didn't want to be there. He got rid of Kenny Atkinson, who, not for nothing, if Kenny Atkinson was the head coach of the Nets in that Boston series, they would have gotten swept. I'll tell you that much. And you bring in Steve Nash, a guy who has never coached. He's played in the NBA. You, I mean, you could say he was an, an on-court coach. Throughout his tenure in the NBA, but he's never been, uh, you know, in charge of, of commanding a whole group of guys. Mm-hmm. And I think that KD knew that, Kyrie knew that, and they wanted to, you know, have a society where they where they ran it. They ran things. They didn't want to be coached. They didn't want to be held accountable. And I think with guys who's had so much success in the league, championships, MVPs, all stars appearances, I think they, they get I think they get that ego where they don't feel like they need to be coached at certain points in their career. And I think because of that, that was the undoing of the Nets last year, last season. Now, granted, Boston was way better than Brooklyn was last year. And I think Boston definitely, they, they deserve to win that series, regardless of if it was a sweep or not. I do think that continuity-wise, the biggest hurdle now for Brooklyn is, all right, KD is back, Kyrie is going to stay, Ben Simmons is going to be back healthy. They did make some additions. How do you still handle the Steve Nash issue? I don't know if they're going to come to, a, you know, they're gonna be each other in the middle with that situation because the stuff that was being coming that was coming out about Steve Nash that's not coming from out of nowhere. That's not coming from a disingenuous place. Hmm. So now it's is Steve Nash magically going to become a better coach, or or are is the same issues going to come around mid season and we're gonna hear rumors about all oh, this guy what's out? Steve Nash might be fired. But what I do think is. There's going to be a very, very short leash for Steve Nash. I think it came under those premises of, of KD coming back, Kyrie coming back, and it will be something if that bad start doesn't actually happen and, K- and Steve Nash actually shows that he could be the head coach of this very, very talented basketball team. So in my opinion, out of the big four sports, your head coach or your manager – does not matter unless they are just atrocious at their job, right? Yeah. Because end of the day in baseball and in basketball, I I, talent's going to win out at the end of the day. They're professionals for a reason. In my opinion, they're not there to coach them. They're they're not being coached. They're checking their egos at the door. And in the NBA, I mean, it's a player-driven league more than any of the other sports leagues. And rightfully, I mean, rightfully so. Rightfully so. They know their worth. Good for them. But you're just really going to – I'm really wondering what the dynamic of the Nets is going to look like when Kevin Durant is having private meetings with the front office. Kyrie Irving is having private meetings with the front office. Are they telling them the same things? Are they all actually going to be on the Mm. same page? I mean, if we're being honest, are they making empty promises to one to just make them shut up until they're making empty promises that – 
it just I just see this becoming a full blown mess that no one's gonna want to be there. And the thing is, it's gonna end up being Ben Simmons and it's gonna end up being Kyrie Irving who get shipped out. KD's gonna stay in Brooklyn. Because the moment I knew that Kevin Durant was truly not going to go anywhere was when the uh, the Jazz turned down, uh, I think it was Obi Toppin and five first-round picks from the Knicks for Donovan Mitchell. If you're turning down that type of package for Donovan Mitchell, what do you think it's going to cost for Kevin Durant? Especially you see the Rudy Gobert deal, too. Mm-hmm. That was a massive overpay. And I, it just... I, you know, this, I, I hate to be that this guy because I'm going to sound like LeBron or not like LeBron, like Skip right now. It all comes back to LeBron with the decision, in my opinion, with, <laughs> with, with these guys just saying all willy nilly. It's like they're playing with force trades on 2K games at this point. Yeah. And I, in my opinion, they're, if they all play, they're, they're still the team to beat in the East. If all three of those guys play, if there's a healthy Kevin Durant, a healthy Kyrie Irving, and Ben Simmons, who truly doesn't have to play the point guard, and if he could just play a stretch, th- uh, a three or a stretch four, that team's gonna be that team's gonna be really good. And granted, I know, you know, the Celtics are gonna be the Celtics, the Bucks are gonna be the Bucks in the East, and who knows what's gonna happen with the Sixers? But and I'm even forgetting the Heat. I mean, the East is deep, but it's it's not as top heavy as the West, but the East is deep, man. And I. I it's just I don't know what these players want at this point because these franchises have given them whatever they've wanted. So I don't know what else you could truly want at the end of the day. And here's the thing, too. I, I, I'm i glad you brought up how deep the East is because I, I think everyone just thought, you know, with a clean slate and everybody back healthy and with just maybe a modicum of better coaching from Steve Nash that it's going to be a foregone conclusion that the Nets are going to win the East. I'm telling you something right now. I understand Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant is two of the most talented players that you will ever see. Mm-hmm. Like you can you can live you can live on the surface 60, 70 years, and you'll still say, yo, I never see someone like Kevin Durant. I think I'd never see someone like uh Kyrie Irving. But the thing thing about it is when you talk about teams that have built chemistry, Miami may not be the most talented team, but they they played. They, they all have a system where they, they don't play through one player. I understand Jimmy Butler is a star player, but there's a lot of guys that can, that, that contribute. And then Milwaukee, yeah, they have Giannis. If, and and I, will, I will say this to the end of time. If Chris Middleton plays in that Boston series, but we're not talking about Boston going into the, the finals. I agree State. more. Could not agree more. So if Milwaukee gets back healthy, they're going to be a lock. They're going to be a lock for that Eastern Conference Finals. Boston is going to be better. I'm not sure if the continuity is going to be a little bit out of whack because of the trade rumors of Jalen Brown. I know Jalen Brown's not happy about being involved in trade rumors because when Jason Tatum did it perform last year in the finals, it was Jalen Brown that was the guy. He was the main guy in that ser- in that final series because mm-hmm. Jason Tatum did have the best series, and he'll tell you that himself. So it could go either one or two ways for the Brooklyn Nets. They're going to get up to maybe a 4-13 start. Steve Nash gets fired. <laughs> next guy gets brought in. And who, who knows if this next guy is going to be another yes man for uh, uh for Brooklyn. Hell, it could be a Mari Stoudemire that can, that can coach the damn Nets at this point. <laughs> but it could either be that or they're going to be a well-oiled machine and win the East. There's no in between. If this team is clicking on all cylinders and they're all healthy they're all, and they're all involved, they're going to be great. They're not good. They're going to be really, really great. So I think that's the most interesting part about this NBA offseason. I know people want to see the chaos of the trades and Brooklyn just being disintegrated because it all started with Harden. It just it just went, went from, from uh, top dog to middle dog. But I do think there is a level of intrigue around them. They are the most interesting team going into um, going into next season, without a doubt. But I do think, even though this is completely, you know, this is completely out of left field. But 
the team that is affected most by Brooklyn reconciling the Los Angeles Lakers. Mm-hmm. If you look at the Lakers roster right now, take LeBron out of the equation, take AD out the equation. It's bad, man. It's not it, good. It, it, it's bad. And they were very, very much banking on Kyrie Irving being a Los Angeles Laker. Guess what? It's not happening, at least for now. I don't know. Midseason, things could change, and he may not want to be in Brooklyn anymore. But for right now, if the Lakers are desperate for help and they know this roster ain't good, you better go out and get somebody. Because right now, with the way this roster is constructed, you go into a series with Golden State. You know what's going to happen? You're going to get swept. You're going to get swept. And as a Laker fan, I can't even be mad because, listen, the proof is right there. You don't have a winning uh, basketball team that that you put on the floor. But you don't know if LeBron's going to stay healthy for every game. And we we call um, Anthony Davis always disabled, AD. (laughs) Russell Westbrook forgot how to play basketball, and I love him dearly, but he's got to play basketball. There is no way you can tell me that the Lakers are a threat in the West. So... And yeah, uh, and I'm gonna be honest. Any team that's paying Taylor Horton Tucker ten million dollars a year, I, I I just I I can't look at you Puzzling. and think that you're set up for success. And don't get me wrong, Taylor Horton Tucker is the most talented high school basketball player I have ever seen play with my own two eyes. <laughs> Tore up my high school team in the state playoffs. One of my best friends guarded him the entire game, and well, he didn't play college ball, so that didn't go very well. <laughs> but um. That includes watching Io Jasumu play as well, who I am very a very big fan of that I'm talking about on this show. But man, that Lakers roster, they just they're the Lakers. It shouldn't be like this. It's like what it's like the tw- the Kyle Kuzma led Lakers from however many years ago that was. And it, dark times. Yeah. And it's just a matter of time till Bronny's playing with LeBron out there too. It's LeBron's league. If he wants it to happen, he's going to make it happen. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you now. It, 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 he's going. He's probably going to have the most shameless tanking that year. Probably sit out the year, fake an injury, and, and get and get his son on the Lakers. I mean, if it's going to happen, sure. But if, if you ask me, what would, would that look good? Because I I, I I I very much remember when LeBron got to the Lakers. Every, there were people who saying already he was the greatest Laker of all time. And instantly I told him to go to hell because now you're just being uh, you need to be ignorant. But if that's the case, then that doesn't even put him even close to anywhere, to any Laker on the list, if you're really being honest. No, I mean, hey, you're not wrong. But moving on to... I don't even know how to describe the last few weeks of Chicago Bears uh, offseason and preseason. I guess promising is one way I would describe it. But the other the other way I would describe it is consequential. And what I mean by that is this front office and this coaching staff, they've given guys opportunities. And if they keep squandering those opportunities away, they are not hesitating to just cut the cord, let him go. I mean, you saw it with Daz Newsome. Couple drop passes, muff punt, dropping passes in practice. Boom, he's gone. He was drafted last year by uh, the old regime. But that's a good sign, I think, in my opinion, that they're not afraid to just let you go if they don't see you as a fit with this franchise anymore. And I think that's a problem that the old regime had. I I, I mean, just kind of holding on for too long at – some points but that's encouraging to me as bad as that sounds if you're talking about another man losing his job oh 100 percent. and and this is why i get offended genuinely offended when people just trash the bears trash what the front office has done over the past years and whatnot and, and here's the thing like people need to understand something the old regime put the Bears into this position. It wasn't the doing of Ryan Poles. It wasn't Ryan Poles saying, oh, we're going to get rid of this guy. We're going to get rid of that guy. I do, I don't think he fits. And, and, and granted, yes, that, that was a part of the reason. But the main thing was that we need to actually rebuild. It, it didn't happen. 
they, we we semi rebuilt. We drafted, we drafted Justin Fields, but the roster wasn't the same when we draft when we had Mitchell Trubisky in 2018, 2019. I think the problem that a lot of people are they're not realizing what the Bears is that regardless of what the roster looks like, and I think you saw this as an example with the Seahawks game, regardless of who was playing or not, you know what was the biggest difference between last year and this year, at least so far? Effort. No matter if it was second string, third string, that hits method that was talked about when Matt Eberfuss got hired, it's being put into play. Mm-hmm. And if you're not buying in, I, like you said, they're not going to keep you around. So I think off the strength of having a head coach who has a philosophy that guys are going to buy into, is this team going to be good? No. I, I And I've said this on numerous occasions. And I, but I also I also think it is, it's borderline offensive to think that this team is going to be so much worse than last year when – not for nothing, Matt Nagy didn't have a clue about what he was doing. He didn't have a clue. And the fact of the matter is, when you look back to Justin Fields' debut, Matt Nagy put him in that position. And I do think regardless of what moves have been made, Ryan Poles has made it a priority to put help around Justin Fields, regardless if it's household names, regardless if if these are offensive linemen that that are are interchangeable, he still has put help around him. No matter if it's the guys that you like or if it's the guys that that we look at and we're like, okay, he belongs on an NFL roster. He's not a star, but he's serviceable. So, I think that. It's been just very very frustrating to watch every national media just not give the Bears a chance all because they don't have household names. And mind you, these are the people who who claim every day they do the homework. They study the ins and outs of the games. They interview people. I guarantee you none of these people have been to Bears camp and actually tapped in with what's going on at practice. And that's my issue because I can't even watch national media anymore when they talk about the Bears because there's nothing positive. It is nothing genuine about anything that they're saying. Yep. And just to kind of go into that national media disrespect, I get the Bears aren't going to be good, but I have seen nothing but hate the last week online. You've seen that the Bears are going to be the worst team in football. They've never seen a team with this little offensive talent on, on to, to provide a quarterback. They currently have a win total on DraftKings of two and a half. The over-under for this team's win total is two and a half wins. And under has better odds. That's easy money. Yeah. I hope they keep it that way. I'll be honest. I hope they keep it that way. I will bet on that. I'll, I'll, put, I'll put a good stack of money on that. It's easy. I mean, yeah, I don't expect them to win more than five, six games. But oh, of course. Yeah, but – out of effort alone, I mean, they're going to be like the Lions of last year, but they have more talent, in my opinion. End of the day, I got a better quarterback. Yeah. I'll, t- I'll take Justin Fields over Jared Goff at this moment in time. And if you say you wouldn't, you're a liar. And I know that <laughs> might be homerism on our part. You know exactly what you're going to get out of Jared Goff. You're going to get 3,800 yards, 25 touchdowns with 10 picks. That is as average – to below average of an NFL quarterback as you are going to find. And good for him. He's made himself a lot of money. He was the highest paid quarterback in football at one point. Never going to shame someone for making money. But man, he does not deserve it. And I was amazed the Lions did not draft a quarterback this past year. But that's that, that's a whole whole different topic. What are your thoughts on Matt Eberflus saying that majority of the stars are going to play the entire first half in this upcoming preseason game against the Browns. Me personally, I get people saying they need reps, but it's a pointless game. And if you have your guys who you know for a fact are locked in as your starters, your Justin Fields, your David Montgomery's, your Cole Komets, whoever else on the defensive side of the ball we want to talk about, majority of the offense line, you can have them play the whole first quarter, I think. I think that's completely fine. But I just do not see 
trotting them out for a whole first half in a pointless preseason game. It's not like it used to be where it was like, oh, the third preseason game's the dress rehearsal. It's a crock of shit, in my opinion. And I just see this blowing up in their face so horribly with a torn ACL from someone. And it, it would just it would be poetic at this point. With like the, I, with the just like the attitude that this new regime is trying to drive, because every meatball fan, us included, is buying into it, and I think everyone's agreeing with what they're saying. But there comes a point when you have to just look at yourself in the mirror and be like, "All right, like cut the shit." In my opinion, at least. Okay, so I'm gonna take a different route, and in my opinion, I think this is a reflection of how not that impressive they have been on offense. And I do think the whole reps thing, I get it. Because because I, I feel like in game time, you you want to get the continuity going. Because there's nothing like, because, you know, you're going against the same guys, you know, three, four days out of the week. And you are, you know, it, it's, you know, the repetition is good. You know, you, you, you see different looks, you see different personnel out there. So I get it. Like it, it, you know, it that does help, but I feel like the game action would actually help. But I do get it from the standpoint, like this is like third preseason game. Is it's, it's technically the fourth preseason game, and normally in the fourth preseason game, you don't play your starters at all. You don't play them because you are one game away. Like the, like the, after that, it's it. Like it's the real the real shit starts. So. If you run your guys out there risking injury, what is going to be the compensation? What is going to, what, how's Matt Eber, Eberfuss going to look? And the season hasn't even started yet. Think about that. If the, the, the season hasn't started yet and you are already, you already run the risk of having a guy tear his ACL, break a collarbone, any little injury, any little thing, it doesn't even have to have to, have to be of extreme severity. Any little injury, everybody's looking at you different, man. I get the like I'm on both sides of the fence. I I don't think it's particularly wrong just because I I feel like he wants to get game action with these guys and actually pinpoint what needs to be fixed before going up against the team that was the runner up in the NFC. I get it, but just be careful. You haven't even had coached a regular season game. You better be careful. Yeah, and like. I just see it as putting yourself in a position to have a fan base in a city turn on you for no reason. Like that's just how I look at it because it's probably not going to be a serious injury. If we're being completely honest, it's going to end up being Justin Fields has turf toe and Trevor Simeon is the week one starting quarterback. That's it's just going to be something really, really ticky tacky. That's just going to irritate people because it could have been avoided. And it's something that could happen to anyone. And it's just going to end up being someone that's way too important, but I digress. And the other thing that I want to mention with the bears is we got to talk about Roquan Smith again. And he is just shooting himself in the foot, man. Like I wanted to back Roquan. I wanted to support him, but I I mean, the money he's getting is just South of a hundred million. Yes. It's a little backloaded, but he is screwing himself by not having an agent because yeah. he's, his feelings are getting hurt during these negotiations when the number that Ryan Poles is giving him is more than generous, if you ask me. And he's just getting offended and that he won't be a Chicago Bear next year. No. I, I, I do respect the fact, though, that Roquan has come out and said he's going to play this year. He's not going to hold out. I do respect that because there's a lot of guys in the league now who are going to hold out. We've seen it happen. But, like, this just has to be, a like, a look in the mirror moment for Roquan where it's like, oh, maybe I should have an agent. Maybe I shouldn't have fired him. And the fact that he had a non-NFL – I don't know the exact story, but correct me if I'm wrong. He had a non-NFL Players Association agent reaching out to other teams about trades. Am I, that, yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, that's just not a good look for him either. Not at all. And I don't even want to touch on the whole Roquan thing. I want to touch on Ryan Poles uh, and stand to his ground. For a guy that is a very uh, – who's a rookie GM who is staring dead in the face of an all-pro linebacker and says, I'm not giving you that contract. 
Mm-hmm. Like you, like you, like I get it. You are a great player. You're a great person, and I will want you on the Chicago Bears for a, a good amount of time of your career. But I'm not giving you that money. That's a very, very big statement to make mm-hmm. for for the rest of the team. This, this, I mean, we had a different stance a couple of weeks back, saying it's a bad, you know. Your predecessor to the set when you are not willing to pay your guys, and it was indicative of the contracts that you were giving out, you know, in the off season. So we had a we had a cause for concern there, mm-hmm. but for the money that that was being offered, round the same as every top paid linebacker, and you think you deserve more? Granted, I I, I think Roquan is has the same mindset as us Bears fans. And that is he's one of the most disrespected players in the league. Mm-hmm. If you ask me, he's he's a top five linebacker. But I guarantee you, if you ask a lot of a lot of these people, they're not even put him in the top five. I something and I, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even be surprised if they don't put him in the top seven. That's where it gets disrespectful. And, and, and I do think a lot of the disrespect too comes from just the way the game has evolved and changed. Off the ball middle linebackers like Roquan they're just not as valued as they were back in the day. If we're yeah. being completely honest, that's going on with um same thing that happened with running backs, and you're just continuing to see it now. I mean, linebackers, running backs. Soon enough, receivers probably aren't going to be paid good enough because they're just going to have <laughs> gadget players like Debo Samuel. Like I, I just, it's wild. It's just like the NBA going positionless, but we're kind of going that direction in the NFL too. Yeah. And it's part of the reason why Tyreek Hill is not a Kansas City Chief. And that's part of the reason why he's trying to convince himself to as a better quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, but I digress. I, I will say, just on the topic of Tua real quick, I uh, I kind of have bought into the Dolphins hype this offseason a little bit the last few weeks. I mean, I just find it hard to believe that, you know, an offense of Jalen Waddle, Tyreek Hill, Mike Jasaki, and then – I think they just have a plethora of running backs back there. It's going to be San Francisco 49ers light, if we're being honest. I just think the yeah. only difference is instead of how Jimmy Garoppolo is able to push the ball to the middle of the field, I think that two is going to push the ball to the sidelines, and they're they're, they're going to feast. I, I genuinely would not be surprised to see them be a top five, top seven offense this year. There is absolutely no way you can fail with those guys you're throwing to. Mm-hmm. They, they, there is exactly. no way. And, and, and if you do, you you got to cut bait with Tua after this year. Uh, you can't you can't waste that talent another year. And you know what? He may never get another starting job. And rightly so. You got you got some you got some demons out there, man. You got road runners out there. If you can't get them the ball, I don't know. And the, and the funny thing is you look back to his days at Alabama. He was playing with nothing but speed demons. Mm-hmm. So I don't. Uh, right now, he's in his element. Like this is literally his element. This is where you know he could thrive at. If he can't do it, he's gonna be joining Daniel Jones and never be the starting quarterback again. Because I do think that. Because go on the topic of Daniel Jones, I genuinely believe that Tyrod Taylor will end the season as a starting quarterback. I I agree wholeheartedly. And I mean, there's a reason he signed there and for the money he did too. Oh, for sure. And Daniel Jones is just a guy where he's almost like is this might be a little bit of a crazy comparison, but like J.R. Smith, in my opinion, where you see those flashes from time to time and you're like, damn, you should be great. You should be a game changer, a superstar. Then they had those moments where you're just scratching your head, like, how the hell did that just happen? And what am I watching? And that happens more often than not with Daniel Jones because he has the intangibles, if you ask me. I mean, when I think of Daniel Jones, I think of his, what was it, 65 yard scramble where he then fell and fumbled at like the five yard line. That's what I think of when I think of Daniel Jones, when he had no one in front of him. And that just pretty much ra- sums him up as a quarterback. I'm, I'm going to be very honest. I really do think Eli Manning is his perfect uh, NFL yeah. comp. If, if because if you look back at, at the career of Eli Manning, and I, I want people to recognize the era, because 
this was an era in the NFL that you you could throw twenty plus picks in a season and they'll still pay you as the starting quarterback mm-hmm. next season. Look at Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning. If you go on Peyton Manning's rookie year, yeah, he has no business being a starting quarterback for the Colts next year. They, they people should have, should have had questions about him. It's a lot of guys who had rookie seasons where they threw 15, 16, 17 and above interceptions. But with Daniel Jones, not only has he had turnover issues, he has availability issues. Granted, that's the yeah. only thing he don't he don't share in common with Eli Manning. But in this day and age, you need to be available because I'm gonna tell you something. While the NFC East has been a dice roll of whichever team it lands on is going to win a division for the past couple of years, the Giants have been in there once since since I don't even remember the last time they won a division. I believe that I believe outside of 2017, the New York Giants last time they won a division was the year after they won the Super Bowl, which where they they were a number one seed and got bounced by the Philadelphia Eagles in a divisional round. So at this time, you you I mean you you dealt with Eli Manning because he got your Super Bowl within his first what three, four years. Yeah, I think Daniel, four. Daniel Jones hasn't even got you close to that. He he has not showed up against the big opponents. The only time he showed up against a division rival was that Washington game last year on Thursday night where they could have won the game if it wasn't for an encroachment. That's it. That's literally it. So I t- I tell you this. If Daniel Jones lasts the season as a starting quarterback, that may be good news for him finding another job. Yeah. He's not going to come back to the Giants, especially, especially if – if they are in good standing draft wise, CJ and Bryce are just sitting right there in your lap. Or if the the guys outside there like Will Levis or Anthony Richardson, if those if those guys fall in your lap, they're cool. But I see Daniel Jones needs to have a big year if he's gonna yep. catch up. Yeah. So moving on to some wrestling news, we could sit here and talk about how great wwe has been uh with the takeover of triple h as the head of creative but we are going to kind of touch on some reports that have come out that cm punk who came back to the industry came back to wrestling after what was it 10 years or not like eight years away whatever it was or so and comes back to aew saying he wants to wrestle all this young talent he's going to put guys over refusing to put over hangman adam page who in my opinion, is one of the best and brightest that that company has to offer. One thousand percent. And I, I can't say I'm surprised about it at this point because, I mean, end of the day, yeah, people change, but like, I, I think we're just all really, really learning that Phil Brooks is CM Punk. And it's CM Punk cannot turn off that switch and he's an egomaniac. And it sucks to say because he's one of my all time favorites from his time in WWE. But I can't stand the guy anymore. Genuinely. And I'm sure you feel the same way. There was a time where you couldn't get me to stop watching WWE. I'm talking about the period, maybe like 2001, 2008. 2008, 2009, that's the kind of stopped watching. 2010, I slowly got back into it. But even the year 2010, I was just like, oh, Jesus Christ, same thing over and over and over. Mm-hmm. See how Puck came up, dropped that pipe bomb promo, and I was blown away. I was back in. Like, I was all the way in, all the way in. And then the summer of Punk happened. I, I, I questioned why he lost to Triple H. I questioned why he got cashed in on after a bank of a main event with John Cena. I I was very proud of his uh, over a year reign, and I was upset that The Rock had to end it. I was so bad at WWE for costing him his dream to main event at WrestleMania because I felt like that the year Batista won, I felt like that should have been Punk's year. 
Yeah. To win it, and the way he got eliminated, it was it, it was a mess. Let's go back to now. The thing that people, the thing that CM Punk was talking about back in 2011, the way Johnson's an ass kisser, John Cena thinks he's the best. Triple H is an egomaniac, and he's only got this position because he's he, he married Stephanie. He has officially gone into business for himself. And I think that hurts me considering, like, I feel like the wrestling fan in us thought it would have been very, very cool to see Tia Punk get back to a big wrestling promotion and actually become its world champion. Mm -hmm. But then you realize everything that everything that comes with it, every all the quotes, all the videos that you see of why CM Punk wanted change. And it wasn't for the betterment of the company. Granted, I would say wrestling got better when CM Punk was on top. Mm -hmm. 1,000%. But if we're talking from an individual standpoint, CM Punk being a star was the only thing he cared about. And granted, there are people who have favorite wrestlers that have stepped on every probably almost every single person to get to the top. If you're a Triple H fan, if you're a Stone Cold Steve Austin fan, if you're if you're if you're a rock fan, they stepped on guys to get to the top. If you're a Shawn Michaels fan, you don't have a you don't you can't contribute to this conversation. Because those were the main guys that stepped on people to get to the top. And that's what Punk hated. But he became that person. And so long, I was blinded by my, by my freshman year of high school self, just absolutely loving the, the, the rebel nature of CM Punk and how he was going to change wrestling, make it better, make it fun, make it more edgy. Mm -hmm. Granted, he did that for me. But growing up is realizing that CM Punk did make wrestling better for some, but he was also a hypocrite when you look back on it. And that sucks. That very much hurts me as a wrestling fan and a fan of his. And I can't see any scenario whether of, of how this is going to have a happy ending for him. But I but one thing I will say, and there was some of that, there was someone that said this, and I had to think about it. I'm like, damn. Correct. CM Punk has been a heel in AEW this entire time. You just didn't even know it. I mean, that's it. <laughs> that that's the truth. It, if we're being completely honest, and I I think that looking back on it, like CM Punk is a hypocrite. We know that he's a hypocrite and he's a narcissist. And I just look back on it. A professional bridge burden, too. Yes. Yes. I mean, he took his former best friend to court. And mentioned, and mentioned that Eddie Kingston was the second best Kingston he's been a ring with, yet he ghosted Kofi. Yeah. Yeah. And I uh, I just, like, I, I think of that quote of Triple H and him, where Triple H is in the suit, Sam Punk is sitting at the table, they're doing... They're they're having their promo, whatever. And Triple H said, "It's not really what you want. We're a lot alike. We did what we had to do to get on top. Differences. I looked everybody in the eye and told them, I'm gonna step on you. I'm gonna walk through you to get to the top. You don't have the balls to do it. What you did, you backdoor your way around it. You try and do it by being a martyr. And that's the truth. Looking back on it, I mean, obviously this is revisionist history. Everyone is able to look like at that time we can look back and just see the writing on the wall with this whole entire situation and how." This would most likely come to fruition if he ever did uh, end up making a comeback. I mean, the balls and the ego on this guy and the lack of self-awareness to think that he could walk into the UFC, if we're being honest, and win fights. I mean, the dude walked out to cult of personality like he was walking into a Ring of Honor event. And it's just like, I, I, I legit, like, I can't watch CM Punk matches anymore from back in the day with the same enjoyment. Yeah. Just, just because as you get older, you kind of realize, and don't get me wrong, 
my favorite wrestler of all time is John Cena. It, like I will always, def- always, it will always be John Cena. I grew up in the era where John Cena was the guy. I started watching wrestling in 2006 at six years old. And John Cena was on top. The, one of the best moments of my childhood was John Cena returning at the 08 Royal Rumble. I'll never forget yeah. it. And, I'm a life drink. But at that time, I turned on Cena because being a Chicago guy, I'm like, oh, <laughs> punk, CM Punk. Everything he's saying is so true. It's so true. But he did. That, that's, just, that's just how he is. He's deceptive. And I just feel bad for those guys in AEW. And as bad as it sounds, kind of feel bad for tony khan kind of i don't i don't i mean i guess not because mm. his, his dad's the one paying the money if we're being completely honest but like it's i cm punk is going to tear apart that locker room i'm gonna tell you why i don't feel bad for tony khan tony khan right now is a child that is he he's the son of the owner of Toys R Us. He can have any toy he wants. He buys any toy he wants. And once he has all the toys in his possession, he picks that favorite one that he always had the memories with. And he thought that he should have been on top in every promotion that he was in. And he's and he anything that that toy will tell him, he'd be like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will do that. I will do that. And also... Not for nothing, it seems like a lot of these guys are doing that too. Why is John Moxley and CM Punk on a regular ass Wednesday when All Out right. is literally right there? Yeah, and like Why? it's just like you look and think like, what are they gonna do for All Out now? Because you don't have time to build a proper program. I mean, I always kind of thought that the plan was gonna be Mox versus Punk at All Out to. Right. to crown the true champion and the fact that they even did an interim champion for cm punk is the biggest crock of shit i've ever yeah. seen in my entire life because yeah. you damn well know nobody else in that company nobody else in the industry is getting that type of treatment because he probably would have walked out if they if they said no yeah yeah I, you know what i didn't think about that i did not think about that but i feel yeah because, yeah. because there's no way that Tony Khan probably wanted to just recreate that story with Punk and Cena. I mean, mm-hmm. like, I don't think he's, I mean, I think he's a mark, but I don't think he's that big of a mark. Oh, I, I think he is. Oh, I don't think he's a big enough mark to where he would try and just redo the exact same storyline. But I, I just, I thought the plan the whole time was going to be, Punk and MJF. I thought it was going to be MJF returning, which it still very well could. I think it happened tonight. Punk, yeah, no, I mean, it very well could be Punk and MJF still, but we'll see. I don't know. And on a less serious note, to kind of wrap up the show here, <laughs> uh, not not sure if you saw this, but Stephen A. Smith was, uh, he's on doing media, media tour for his, um, his biopic or that uh that he's releasing i think it's coming out new year or something like that book on his life and he's on the paul feinbaum show today and essentially he uh feinbaum asked him you know enough people like you Stephen a would you ever consider running for president and Stephen a answered with if i thought i could win yeah i would have told you hell no hell no years ago i was a father out of wedlock obviously what you think about the standards that were once held in the white house I'm pretty damn good, but I'm not perfect. And those imperfections obviously would be highlighted. Could you imagine a debate stage with Stephen A. Smith on it? (laughs) And it's not outside the realm of possibility at this point, which is the sad part. We've seen some very interesting people run for president. That's putting it very, very lightly. Yeah. Stephen A. Smith running for president, and if this was maybe five years ago, I I, I would I would run to the booth right now to vote for him. <laughs> and I've got to be very very honest with myself. Stephen A. has become, has become very corny to me. Oh, over the years. No, absolutely, because 
He knows he's the face of ESPN at this point. He knows he could get away with whatever he wants to say. Yeah. And good for him. He's built that brand up to where he can do it. But he kind of has lost his fastball. There's no, there's, there's no denying it. And, I mean, good for him. I still enjoy watching him. I still enjoy listening to him because when Stephen A is on, there is no sports media personality that can touch Stephen A. And I just think oh. – I, I think losing that fastball comes down to ESPN kind of overutilizing him and overextending him, trying to put him. He shouldn't be doing UFC shit. He shouldn't have anything to do with golf. Nothing with baseball. Keep him with the NBA and the NFL. And there is nobody on this planet who's going to outtake Stephen A. Smith. And, and you know, I, I do think his downfall came when the radio show ended. Yeah, I think that was the most authentic version of Stephen A. Because if you look at his first take, we're looking at the actor, Stephen A. Smith. Radio show was Stephen A. Smith. But unfortunately, when it came to the things he said on first take, he had to be the actor, Stephen A. Smith, on his radio show. And I think that was like the real downfall for it. Listen, all I know is this. He will get votes. Just off the just off the fact that there are people like me out there that have a whole album of memes th- dedicated to him, so because of that, they are going to vote for him off the strength of that. Because not for nothing, for the people that are younger than me, and this doesn't include you, but <laughs> <laughs> there are there, there are people that are very easily swayed. And, and all you got to do is make them laugh. Yep. And you're you're sold in their eyes. We are very easy generation, so that that shit is scary. Okay, boy. Oh yeah, and I I, I just think my my favorite tweet that I uh, I kind of saw about this whole uh, Stephen A. Smith situation was um, like so it was the quote tweet of someone saying Stephen A. Smith just told Paul Feinbaum that he considered running for president of the United States, and someone uh, tweeted. Chinese energy executives paid hunt, uh, millions to Hunter Biden, who was on crap. <laughs> you know something? I actually feel bad for weed smokers like my friends and my girlfriends. If he become president, you have to find something else because it's over <laughs> there. You ain't getting no more marijuana over there. <laughs> Oh, God. But yeah. I will always stick with my theory that he is an avid weed smoker outside of ESPN. I, I mean, there's there's no denying it. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, you can't tell me that he doesn't. I just, it's a shtick at this point, and I still laugh at it because he knows that people laughed at it 15 years ago when he said it for the first time, and he knows people are going to continue to laugh at it. But I will say, the most I've ever laughed at a Stephen A. Smith video was when he was doing, I don't even know, if there's an Instagram story, Vine, whatever it was, and he's doing a Q&A, and someone said uh, that he was, Stephen A, do you eat ass? And he just did the, huh, 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 huh. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I know exactly what the question was. I know exactly what the reference was. They was asking him if he was still a booty legged hit man because yes. of this interview. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I go back to that video so many damn times because it's just like, damn, he really said that. He yep. really said that. I you know man at ESPN said it with no reservations. And guess what? What's ESPN <laughs> going to tell him? Stop? Because he's not going to stop. <laughs> Listen. He has no disagreements on this side. He's just like me. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, if we uh, if we have Stephen A. Smith running for president, man, oh man, the content that comes out of him on the internet will be, I I don't know if it'll ever be topped, but let's hope we don't get to that situation. But if you made it this far, we appreciate it. Thanks for uh, watching the show. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, leave us a review, and we'll be back next week. Thank you.